Francis, thanks for joining us. You were competing at a time, of course, you were at Seoul 88 when uh, the Ben Johnson scandal erupted. Yeah. Those must have been interesting times. And, and looking back to then and, and where we are now, how, how far do you think anti-doping and, and has come and how much has WADA contributed to that? Thankfully, I think anti-doping has come a really long way since then. Um, in those days, I think there was significant distrust of, about the institutions that run sport. Um, well, there wasn't a WADA then, but I think WADA has really been helpful in getting us where we're getting. I mean, this new um, code that we have is tremendous improvement over the last one that we have, and some of us hope that it'll continue to evolve in that direction. Today, I was saying earlier in another panel that I think WADA needs to continue with bringing more transparency to not, not just to anti-doping, but to the results of the anti-doping tests, um, the results of the tests of people who have failed tests prior. It'll be helpful for athletes to get to know all of that information because what it does is it gives them the satisfaction that the system is working for them. And then I think with that kind of confidence, you will get more whistleblowing and, and, and so on. Yeah. You mentioned the World Anti-Doping Code and, and sanctions in particular. Mm -hmm. The code offers a, a number of different themes or changes, if you like. Mm -hmm. You were quite strong in your support for longer sanctions. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. I think we tend to focus on the strength and endurance benefits of doping, right? And so it, it becomes easy to argue that after a two-year ban or a four-year ban, whoever has been caught doping and is out of the sport and is being tested regularly will lose that strength advantage, okay? My concern has always been primarily with the a qualitative aspect of all of this where I think that when a person is doping, they're able to put in more repetitions at practice, whether it's with throwing a baseball, whether it's with triple jumping. I mean, I was a triple jumper and because of all the pounding, you can't practice your triple jump trade more than twice a week. You need two full days of rest between uh, practice sessions, if you're j I mean, jumping practice sessions. Now, if somebody's on steroids and if they can practice three, four, five times a week, clearly the technique is going to be better. And that doesn't go away with time. When you've got a finer technique than somebody, that doesn't go away with time served, right? And so they'll come back, and even if their strength and endurance equal to me now, if they've got better technique, I would argue that they still have an advantage going from, from their doping days. So for me, that's been one reason. The second reason is I think that sport should belong to clean athletes. If you demonstrate that you, can't, you, you participate in sport without being clean, I really don't think you should be given the chance to come back and disadvantage clean athletes. And the third thing is I, I think that kids these days at age 15 and 16 when they sort of start flirting with elite sports or the, 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 the prospects of elite sports, they look at where our records are, world records are. It's very easy for kids just to skirt sport and say, ah, well, I'll just do it recreationally or I'll move on to something else because some of those records have gotten to a point now where if you're 16 or 17 or 18 and you look at them, it's difficult to say, I can attain these from where I am at age 18 if I don't get assistance from doping. And I worry about those kinds of concerns that young children who are coming into sports, the decisions they have to make. So for me, th these have been the reasons where I think that the uh, penalties have to be stronger, they have to be more enduring, if I may put it that way. Yeah. You talk about the clean athlete. Mm -hmm. How much more nowadays is the clean athlete promoted in, in, in sports governing bodies? How much more do we hear about the clean athlete? Well, I think WADA has been really helpful with that, um, but I still encounter athletes who make national teams who maybe when they visit the water booth becomes the first time that they encounter even the concept of clean athlete or the phrase of a, what a clean athlete is. I, I think everybody talks about doping and even athletes at that tender age. But I think the whole sort of um, moniker of a clean athlete is something that I think WADA has been very influential and it's helpful. And looking at the WADA Athlete Committee, it's 10 years old now. You've been able to bring some good experience to that. And, and what have you learnt from being around former athletes and people from different sports? Yeah, it's been, it's been a wonderful experience. I mean, um, just the diversity of opinions and thoughts that we bring to this. Um, we have a commonality of purpose. 
Um, and I think that's one of the things that I'm most proud of is that everybody on that committee really is trying to improve the situation for today's athletes. And so there's no doubt about that. But we do have quite interesting debates sometimes about, for example, whether lifetime bans are the proper way to go and so on and so forth. But I think it's all healthy and uh, I've just enjoyed my time working with, with, with these colleagues. Of course, doping as an issue is, is, it's been around a while now, but there are new emerging issues threatening sport and, and, and you alluded it to it at the ADO symposium. You mentioned we're facing a struggle for the heart and soul of sport. What do you mean by this and how serious an issue are these different matters? So, so when we think about um, illegal betting, for example, it's really easy to think or see or uh, consider who it is that clean sport is struggling with, right? I think it becomes a bit blurred when we talk about doping. And I would argue that the fight is still the same. I would argue that there are people who are behind these networks. I, I, I won't even say cartels because I think there's so many of them that cartel isn't the right moniker for them. But these networks of people who promote doping in sport, I think that there are people who are behind them who are doing it for a reason. And so I think that's who the struggle is with. And it's, I think it's imperative that we not lose this battle. I think it's imperative that sport remains clean for the young boys and girls, men and women who have committed to use sport as a way that, in which they socialize themselves into global society. And it's our responsibility now, today, to those of us who happen to be in these roles to make sure that we fight to the extent we can for that. Francis Daly, thank you very much. Thank you so much.